since the end of the Cold War, anyway, the international conventions have been don't overfly each other's territory, you know, except with spy satellites, you know, don't send balloons and things like that. So do you think that this represents just as a broader issue for, you know, national security of any any country? Because these have been spotted over South America and, you know, other places. Do you think that this is sort of a the beginning of a new Cold War of balloon technology? Absolutely. I think that this is a, you know, very dangerous new um, era of surveillance. And, you know, we really need the counterintelligence to be matching the threats that we have. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Amir Siraj. Amir studies astrophysics at Harvard University and is interested broadly in theoretical astrophysics. He is a Goldwater Scholar and U.S. Presidential Scholar. He is co-president of Harvard Students for the Exploration and Development of Space and former senior U.S. editor of the Harvard Political Review. His research advisor is Professor Abraham Loeb. Amir Siraj, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me again, John. The skies are filled with balloons these days of unknown or unclear origin. And clearing that up has been not very forthcoming from the U.S. government as to what these, at least the first one, we know what that was. It was a Chinese uh, balloon. But these other objects, um, uh, which we fired on, (laughs) firing a missile on these things, are uh, unidentified still. And you have been working to privately to track through a data set backwards to try to figure out where these balloons came from. What data set did you use and what analysis, uh, what was your technique to try to figure out and get these back to an origin point? Yeah, so these are really fascinating objects and incidents. Um, These occurred on February 10th, 11th, and 12th. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and resulted in the downing of three separate unidentified objects. And these occurred over different locations. So the first one was near uh, Dead Horse, Alaska. Uh, The second was in central Yukon. And the third was above Lake Huron. And these, of course, all occurred after the shoot down of the confirmed Chinese spy balloon off the coast of Carol of South Carolina about a week earlier. And so the first step in figuring out where these objects may have come from and along what trajectories they traveled is to figure out exactly where they were at what time and at what altitude. And so a lot of that useful information comes from the press releases and uh, Department of Defense and NORAD statements about the downings themselves. So those usually come with a timestamp and an altitude and a general location. And and then you can refine the location by, um, you know, I've been looking at uh, flight patterns for Air Force aircraft that have been searching for debris in the wake of the downings. And so that usually gives you a better sense of, of where the downing happens specifically or you know other clues from, from various uh, government statements. There's also, in some cases, like the object downed over Lake Huron, additional data that we can fold in. So the fact that it was picked up on radar above Montana the night before it was downed over Lake Huron, that's really useful information. We have like a general uh, time that that happened at. We also know some details about its trajectory uh, in addition to that, which is before flying over Montana, the U.S. Air Force originally detected it 
when it was flying over southern Alberta, and that after Montana, it flew over upper Michigan and Wisconsin. And so, you know, as you can see, there's a lot of additional information about this Lake Huron object, and that's why a lot of my work has focused on it. But, um, you know, there, there's some similar clues for the other objects as well. Now, what's crucial for understanding all of these is that they moved with the winds. And so this has been confirmed by the DOD, the White House, uh, every party involved, that these objects did not have their own means of propulsion or any ability to maneuver but rather they were airborne and they moved with the prevailing winds. And this was confirmed in, in all of the cases. And that's really useful because if an object had its own means of propulsion, it'd be really hard to figure out, you know, what trajectory it followed unless you have, you know, really, really dense sampling of location and time and altitude. But this way, you know, even if we have one data point or two or three data points on a particular object in terms of where it was at what time, we can use wind data, which is very well known, to fill out its trajectory, both backwards and forwards in time. And so this is what I've been doing. And um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and atmospheric administration has a very useful tool for scientists called high split. And so what high split does is it essentially computes the trajectories of air parcels. And uh, this is really useful for studying pollution, for example, because you can see where the air in a particular, you know, point on the globe came from as a function of time. So, you know, it's usually used, at least the use cases I've seen have, have typically been for studying air pollution, but you know, it's, it's also very useful in a case like this, where we have these airborne objects that are essentially these, these three unidentified objects essentially acted like balloons. And there's no reason they couldn't have been, balloons according to uh, physics and the high split code allows us to trace what exactly the air patterns were at the time and then when you combine that with where and when and at what altitude these objects were flying it allows us to figure out where they may have came from now, do you think that there could be a sampling problem here? In other words, so we see the initial Chinese balloon, and you could actually literally see that. Some people spotted it. And then something changed because then we had those three other side, you know, reports. Do you think that it's simply a matter of selection? In other words, the, you know, they took some filters off of the radar systems, and now they're seeing stuff that they normally would have filtered out, and now they're seeing it. And that this phenomenon has just been there the whole time, you know, and we just didn't notice it. Or do you think this is actually represents, you know, some sort of uh, cohesive operation by China for espionage? Right. So, I mean, that's a super, super important question that I don't think I have the answer to necessarily. And, and, um, but, but there's some useful facts, which is that, you know, NORAD and the White House have both said <laughs> that they, in the wake of the Chinese spy balloon incident, that they have opened up the filters on their radar and as a result have been finding things that are smaller in size and at different altitudes from what they usually look for. And, you know, while this sounds kind of shocking that, you know, why weren't the radar filters opened previously, it seems like the reasoning was that if you open up the filters like this, you have a lot more noise to deal with. So flocks of birds or um, let's say party balloons might show up on 
the radar, but you also might end up finding objects like the three that ended up being shot down by the Department of Defense. And so while, you know, there's a legitimate reason that there's noise, I mean, it's probably something that should have been, the filter should have been opened a long time ago, and then algorithms should have been developed to to deal with the noise accordingly, or, or, or manpower. But, um, so we definitely know that there is a sampling problem. Uh, the question is, you know, how much is sampling and how much is not? So U.S. government has gone on the record um, stating that the discovery of these three objects is at least partially due to um, due to sampling error. And, you know, in the case of 100% of, of, of the fact that we detected these three objects to be attributable to sampling error and the fact that we just adjusted the radar sensitivity of our national defenses, then you can use Poisson statistics and figure out that we may have been missing 40 to 400 of these per year in terms of, you know, that's just a 90% confidence interval. Now, of course, if this is a if this represents a sort of recent change in the frequency, we wouldn't know that. We would have to wait and see if uh, if these these objects continue to enter our airspace at the frequency we saw this past weekend. Now, of course, the DoD's response might not be the same. Um, they might not, you know, if if these end up uh, entering. U.S. airspace at a rate of hundreds per year, they may not want to shoot down every single one of them. Who knows what their reaction might be? But I, I think I think we have to wait and see. And I, my intuition um, tells me, you know, simply because we didn't have the capability, or we hadn't turned on rather the capability to find um, objects at these altitudes, at these speeds, and as small as as small as they were, I think they were all about the size of a small car. Um, that a lot of this, if not all, is likely sampling error. Well, the other thing too, you gotta you, you have to put yourself in the position of the DoD. They see one Chinese balloon, and they're like, "Are there more?" You know, so naturally, increasing the sensitivity would be certainly something I would do, but at the same time, they, they, they can't be firing $300,000 aim nine cruise missiles at Walmart bags, you know, flying to the air. So it's, it's a juggling. And I can see why they didn't have the sensitivity because you, you don't want to pick up that kind of flotsam and airborne stuff because, well, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, things blow around, people launch balloons. Um, and they don't really seem to pose too much of an aviation threat or else we'd be seeing airliners going down. So I can see kind of see why they did that. But I wonder if they just increased the sensitivity just to see if there, this was an ongoing operation, so to speak. Now, my next question relates to the Galileo project and searching for UAP. Will the instrumentation that you guys have sitting up on the roof of Harvard, will it see these things? I mean, would it pick them up or would your algorithm just filter them out? It should. Um, so, essentially, the algorithm tries to uh, sort out things that are known. So, you know, airplanes and helicopters, uh, things like that, um, birds. But the way that it does so is with optical data, I mean, as well as you know, many other wavelengths. But the point is that since it doesn't rely solely on, you know, radar, uh, there is a difference between a bird and, you know, a, an object like one of the three that, that were shot down last weekend. And so those should show up as, you know, on not part of the classification scheme and uh, we should be able to find them. 
Do you think that that sort of same type of technology would be useful to the DOD? In other words, that, that those sorts of algorithms and things like that seem to me to be of, of immense use here in, in filtering stuff out. But I don't know how much they have um, updated their radar systems. You know, um, I know in some cases, you know, they could be decades old, but it just seems to me that this is their next step is to start sort of filtering data like this in a more proactive way, wouldn't you think? Exactly. And that's sort of what I was alluding to with with uh, our discussion earlier about them opening the filters. Yes, you find many more birds and, um, and party balloons, but even with radar data, um, if you have an algorithm that's trained on, on uh, let's say, how birds tend to move and what exactly their radar signature looks like. I, uh, you, you could, there, there's not, there's nothing really technically stopping you from, from filtering those out. So I think the DOD is, is definitely, um, going to have to work on those capabilities. And good thing is that they, they have more than enough money to do so. Um, and, and so I am confident that, um, that that will be done fairly quickly. Now the question that everybody's been waiting for, what were the origin points you were able to project back to with the data set? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the Lake Huron object. Um, So this one, as I mentioned, was ultimately shot down over Lake Huron and uh, the debris ended up on the Canadian side. Um, And this occurred on February 12th, 12th. So Sunday afternoon. Um, But the night before on Saturday, it was uh, seen above Havre, Montana. And previously the U S Air Force had detected it in southern Alberta, and then in between the Montana sighting and the Lake Huron shootdown, it had traveled across Wisconsin and over Upper Michigan. And we also know this, just like the other objects, was this object was at the whim of the winds. And indeed, if you one of the first things I did was checking whether that was true, given all of this data for this object. And so what I did is I started at the shoot down location, the altitude of 20,000 feet at the particular time. And I integrated backwards and indeed you see it crossing the uh, upper peninsula of Michigan, crossing Wisconsin. And, um, you know, obviously there are a few different possible trajectories, but, um, you, you very clearly see a cluster of them, uh, hitting Havre, Montana. And that was indeed right around the time that it was spotted over Montana, which was, um, on Saturday in the evening. And so you start out with this altitude of 6.1 kilometers and then you select the the path that brings it right above Havre, Montana, that one, which gives you an altitude above Montana of about 7.4 kilometers. And then you can simply integrate backwards in time from that point. And sure enough, all of the trajectories go over Southern Alberta. And that's when the U S air force, uh, first detected it. All the trajectories passed through the Gulf of Alaska through the Pacific above the Pacific ocean, South of the Aleutian islands, uh, over Japan and the Korean peninsula. And most notably, all of the trajectories for the Lake Huron object end up over mainland China. And, uh, you know, this is pretty interesting and, and also alarming, uh, because, you know, if this ends up being confirmed as 
Chinese in origin, that would be a really major uh, flare-up in political tensions, especially on the heel of the spy balloon. And um, the other two objects did not have as sort of detailed time and location pairs. Um, and in particular, the object that was down near Dead Horse, Alaska, uh, is kind of difficult to track backwards because winds were very, very sensitive to altitude at that point in time at that location. And so, you know, when given a altitude like 40,000 feet, which is just, you know, one significant figure, um, there, the number of trajectories that are possible just vary so, so widely. But I did get a very clear result for the uh, Yukon shoot down. The main issue there that I had to contend with was the fact that they did not release the actual location itself. They just said central Yukon, but they mentioned that it was northeast of Dawson City, and also that it, the shoot down occurred at about 100 miles or 160 kilometers east of the uh, US Canada border. And so that actually narrows it down quite a bit. And integrating backwards in time, we find that that trajectory also intersects with China. And what's particularly fascinating here is that both the Lake Huron object and the Yukon object, when you integrate their trajectories backwards, they both intersect Northeast China on the morning of Thursday, February 9th, and Northwest China on the morning of Wednesday, February 8th. And so this is, this is, um, this would be a very odd coincidence. And I think, you know, as a matter of national security should be looked into, uh, very, very seriously. Now, one of your projects is searching for the landing site of an interstellar meteorite. Do you think that we might have the assets, the satellite assets and aircraft assets and things like that, to actually figure out where these balloons are to a very high degree of accuracy? Do you think that the Pentagon has doesn't have to search hundreds of kilometers, but knows pretty much where these things fell, raising the chances of recovery? I certainly hope uh, that they have the capability uh, to recover the debris. I think that one thing that's difficult with the cases of these three objects is that they were fairly small and clearly pretty light because they didn't have any means of propulsion, but they were staying afloat. And they were shot down by air-to-air missiles. So, you know, there is there is the modeling that has to go into the DOD's calculations of the direction that the missile was traveling in and and um and the speed and the various things that the payload could have been or the objects could have been made out of and the resulting patterns that one would expect you know, on the ocean or on the ice or over land. But I think all of that modeling is, is, is doable. The question is how much, if anything, uh, would, would remain after a missile impact on a, on an object like that. And, you know, even if there are small fragments that the DOD is able to pick up, those will be very telling, um, in terms of the materials that that these objects were made of, or you know, even finding materials that that uh, that signify certain capabilities, whether it be intelli- intelligence gathering or otherwise. So, 
you know, I I'm hopeful that that the DoD may find uh, the debris for at, at least one of these balloons. Now, with these smaller balloons, barring the giant Chinese one, which was absolutely enormous and had a huge payload, which to me looked like solar panels, you know, whatever it was, was, you know, solar powered, a giant espionage camera or whatever heat, whatever it was looking for. But these types of things, these much smaller ones, those in the size of a car, these types of balloons, um, the payloads are, are can be you know, oftentimes it's simply a, you know, styrofoam cooler. <laughs> so so they might be looking for pieces of styrofoam if that can even survive the hit from a sidewinder whistle. But the other question is, is that, you know, people have been talking about the shapes of these objects, the reports of a hexagonal object and a, uh, you know, a tubular object or something like that. Those, at first glance, you know, people that are interested in UAP are going to say, well, that's that's interesting. But at the same time, that looks a lot like a balloon payload, you know, those shapes, especially if you want to reflect or, or hide radar. So is there anything in the, in the shapes of those that might lead you as a physicist to think, well, maybe these are stealthy, you know, that's been mentioned, or maybe these are just some kind of standard um, payload for a, uh, a, you know, a weather balloon or something like that. Yeah, no, I think I, I had a similar reaction, which is that these, these sound like uh, balloons that were, Probably designed to uh, minimize their their radar cross section. Um, you know, obviously the size of these objects or balloons or whatever we want to call them. Um, it seems like they were designed to evade U.S. Uh, detection capabilities because think about it, the U.S. had to open up the radar filters. NORAD had to open up. The radar filters in order to be able to detect these objects. And so the fact that these were below the detection threshold in terms of size, also in terms of altitude and speed, I, I don't think that should be ignored. I think that uh, sounds like um, it, it may have been deliberate, um, you know, especially if these were uh, adversarial in, in, in nature. And, you know, that might sort of raise the question, well, you know, why send balloons anyways when we have, uh, when we have satellites? But the fact is, or that when every, you know, major um, developed country has, has satellites, but balloons have, have distinct advantages over satellites, you know, everything from signals, intelligence, uh, certain frequencies of, uh, communication that that can't be picked up in space but can be picked up in the atmosphere um to you know just imaging let's say you wanted to do optical uh imagery or you know film a video first of all balloons can film videos over sensitive sites because they move relatively slowly satellites are stuck uh, uh usually just taking images and uh you know, you don't really need bulky equipment. And that's why the fact that these were relatively small doesn't surprise me. You know, if you're, if we think about the Lake Huron object that was uh, shot down at a, an altitude of 20,000 feet, you know, if at 20,000 feet, you have a camera with a grape sized opening, then the diffraction limit, the theoretical limit to the imagery that you can produce with a good camera, grape size opening at that height would rival the resolution of the state of the art U S and China spy, spy satellites, which is 10 centimeters on the ground. So, you know, th there are major advantages to balloons and especially ones that clearly fly below the detection threshold of of the United States. Now these balloons also um, are cheap. <laughs> it just has to simply be said that way. They're, it's cheaper than a spy satellite, and it can linger, you know, longer than a passing spy satellite can. Um, so these there there are inherent advantages. The problem is internationally, 
ever, since the end of the Cold War, anyway, the international conventions have been don't overfly each other's territory, you know, except with spy satellites, you know, don't send balloons and things like that. So do you think that this represents just as a broader issue for, you know, national security of any, any country? Because these have been spotted over South America and, you know, other places. Do you think that this is sort of a the beginning of a new Cold War of balloon technology? Absolutely. I think that this is a, you know, very dangerous new um, era of surveillance. And, you know, we really need the uh, counterintelligence to be matching the threats that we have. So, you know, we need radar systems that can see down to very small sizes. We need the algorithms that can, you know, throw out uh, known objects and animals and what have you. Um, and we need to have protocols in terms of, uh, in terms of what to do when we find these objects and, and also, you know, international standards for, uh, for the consequences of, of flying over, uh, another country's airspace. I mean, this is, this is really not just a matter of national security, but one of global security. It has to be set global security because, you know, anybody can launch anything, you know, and if you set a precedent, then all of a sudden you have, you know, nations at odds with each other, you know, floating balloons over each other with missiles flying. And that's what worries me is missiles flew, <laughs> you know, um, but if it's over, you know, in this case, NORAD territory, you can do that. But at the same time, it's, it is not ideal. Whenever, whenever you lose the missiles, it is not ideal. Um, now, I have another question for you, and it's a scary one. Um, Chinese surveillance or any any country surveillance, we'll just we'll we'll decouple it from China. Any country could overfly another country and essentially eavesdrop on cell phone signals, right? So mm -hmm. could they collect data on individuals from such a balloon? Oh, certainly. Yeah, it's it's possible to do so from a balloon, you know, obviously if there were uh, assets on the ground, like, like, you know, spies that were able to set up um, uh, a payload similar to that on the balloon, they could do so from the ground as well. But that's a huge risk uh, that, that simply doesn't exist when, when we're talking about spy satellites that are simply focusing on, on imaging and, you know, everything from from that to being able to produce high quality high fidelity films of operations day-to-day -day operations at sensitive military sites uh, such as the ones where we uh, would launch ICBMs out of you know I mean balloons just have a entirely different set of capabilities and um, it really seems like the start of a new era. Now, it's worth noting here, too, though, that the idea of using balloons for, um, <clears throat> well, let's say, global affairs or cold warfare or warfare is nothing new. Um, in fact, the, the only people killed in World War II, you know, within the continental United States were killed by a balloon bomb. Uh, by, by Japan. Right. So we're looking at a very, very old technology. We have had balloons and China's had balloons longer than anybody that, um, that goes back a long way. But the, you know, we have a tendency to modernize our technology, you know, even though it's based on an old idea, you know, a car is basically a carriage, you know, that used to be drawn by a horse, but we still use it because obviously locomotion is, is very useful. But the, the idea that, that these balloons, you know, people are sort of saying, well, this is an antiquated sort of, you know, way of doing these things, but it's not. It's actually a very, very dangerous um, geopolitical development that could have implications on anything, you know, data collection of any type. And I don't know that we could really build a system to counter this that doesn't require us, you know, firing missiles all the time, you know. Do you see a way that we could filter you know, that, that the Air Force, you know, could could say, well, we need to determine which one of these things are spy balloons, you know, and 
you know, we need to get them, get them, especially if they're flying at 20,000 to 40,000 feet, which is where they can get sucked into the engines of a jet airliner. Do you think that we, we're, we have a realistic way of dealing with all of these threats? You know, um, I mean, could we build, <laughs> could we build a, a ground-based anti, <laughs> anti-balloon type of setup where, um, we can simply shoot them down without, you know, without having to go through the, you know, the approval of calling Justin Trudeau or vice versa or whatever, do you think we could actually create a shield, a balloon shield? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely possible, uh, particularly given the fact that these balloons travel with the wind by definition. And so they're moving very slowly. You know, it's, it's extremely difficult to build a uh, missile defense system or um, in particular, if you want to, defend against um, incoming ICBMs. That's extraordinarily hard. Uh, but with with balloons, it, it is a lot easier given that these are moving at speeds of tens of miles per hour. Um, given that if you have the right imaging, you know, ideally a combination of radar and optical imaging, you can characterize and identify these uh, fairly uh, easily. And, and also given that if you pierce the skin of a balloon, it should come down. And so, you know, we wouldn't necessarily need to use the same kinds of um, weaponry that, that was used uh, to down these three objects. So I, I, think, I think that's um, definitely feasible. Uh, it's, it's really a matter of, of investment, investment into uh, both the detection capabilities and if this ends up being a common occurrence as you know suggested by the fact that we saw three of these right after we uh, turned up our radar sensitivity you know if it ends up being very common uh we're going to need uh, a system like that and um of course there will also be major uh, sort of political tensions and also i just wanted to mention based on what you were saying earlier about balloons being an old technology, uh, but you know the fact that they're actually very dangerous is absolutely correct because payloads, like the cameras and the antennae and all of the things that you would want to put on a balloon, have modernized and the capabilities for you know what you can do within a let's say a one meter by one meter by one meter box have uh, developed exponentially. And, and so a balloon is just being able uh, to get within tens of thousands of feet of your target instead of hundreds of kilometers. And so balloons are about, are about proximity and are about slow speeds. And when you combine them with the modern uh, sensor technology in, that we have in 2023, they are enormous threats to national and global security. Another question would be, too, is that, you know, look, whenever you have something secret and it's on an aircraft, you know, whatever that aircraft may be, usually you have a way to destroy it. In other words, you, you know, destroy the Norton bomb site back in World War II or, or um, you know, if your, your espionage plane gets shot down or otherwise intercepted or your ship or whatever, destroy it, you know, st you know, stick the materials in acid or throw them overboard, something like that. I worry that this could be applied to balloons with, you know, explosives in the payload or some other means of destroying the payload so that the adversary doesn't get a hold of it, which means obviously a very dangerous situation for anybody on the ground. If we go into a balloon cold war, I would think that's the biggest risk, wouldn't you? Certainly, yeah. And I, I think that's why all of the recovery teams are, are being really careful and have have experts in explosives and biological and chemical weapons on them. But, um, you know, I think that's why it's it's really untenable to, to get into a balloon cold war because that situation – it's arguable whether it's even a cold war anymore. If um, if there are capabilities on the balloons, whether they're for um, erasing data or er erasing information about the payload itself, that 
could uh, cause physical harm, you know, you could argue that's the beginning of a hot war. And so I think that this this problem needs to be, you know, taken care of expeditiously in terms of finding the debris, um, in terms of instead of brushing away these these uh, incidents, really, you know, getting to the bottom of of it. And I, I think these trajectories are uh, really um, alarming. So, you know, the point is that a, collo- a balloon Cold War would be a very bad situation for everyone. Now, my last question in regards to the balloons before we move into related subjects is this. Now, we also know as of today in the media that China has at least two facilities that appear to be areas where they launch balloons. One's in inner Mongolia and the other is on Hainan Island. And were your models, um, did you have the accuracy to be able to determine if it was from the general area of either of these facilities or do you just simply have somewhere from mainland China? Yeah, so um, the Lake Huron object and the uh, Yukon object, neither of them could have come from the Hainan site, but both of them certainly could have come from from Inner Mongolia. Uh, So that that is definitely a possibility that's on the table. Now... What does this teach you as a member of the Galileo Project and looking for UAP? What does this uh, whole affair teach you as far as uh, methodology and moving forward with the Galileo Project as far as looking for UAP and un- identifying ones that aren't <laughs> apparently from another nation state? Yeah, well, so one thing that this highlights is that, um, you know, whether an object is propelled or not is is very telling right because if it's moving with the winds and you can track that movement um you know that it's it must be a balloon like object and if it's not and you can you can show that the winds were moving in a particular direction and and the object was moving in another direction that shows evidence of maneuverability of propulsion and so i think that's that's one thing that this this episode has uh, revealed. I think it's also revealed that it's important to have capabilities to look for things of, of all sizes, and you know, small sizes are are really really uh, important uh, to look out for because you know things may be made small on purpose. And um, you know, finally, I think this just underscores the importance of the kinds of algorithms that, uh, you know, the team has been building in the Galileo project, which are able to essentially rule out known examples, you know, when encountered with, you know, a certain object that's, that's imaged by the system, ruling out helicopter, airplane, bird, and really delivering to the scientists uh, what's left, you know, rather than assuming that something should look a particular way that, or, or trying to look for, for some specific type of object, rather just looking for anything that doesn't fit these very well-known uh, classified categories. Can you apply to the Galileo project um, algorithms and all this? Can you apply machine learning to try to get better? You know, let it better itself at determining the mundane. Yes, and so that that's actually what uh, what these algorithms are using. They they're they're um, they're using ML and AI, um, and it you know it, it, I, I've seen the results and it's it's quite uh, it's quite astonishing. Um, what what these algorithms can do, and I'm really excited uh, for them to be applied to the data that GP will collect. And it seems to be that it immensely important for SETI at large. You know, um, the recent story of eight 
signals of interest that were missed by the first pass, machine learning caught them. And whether, you know, whatever they represent, of course, is doesn't really play into this. It's just that they caught them. And that maybe if you're applying this in the Galileo project, you might actually see things that you would normally have dismissed, right? Exactly. And I think that's, that's going to be so important in all of astronomy and, you know, any field where, you know, or any problem where searching for anomalies is important and when anomalies can, can uh, teach us a lot, you know, AI is so much better at, uh, at finding patterns in extremely large data sets than, than humans are. And um, taking advantage of that, of that capability is extremely important for, for SETI uh, and, and for, but broadly for anything in which you need to find anomalies. In regards to altitudes. Now we know that, that, you know, you know, balloons like the original Chinese uh, espionage balloon, I mean, those things can go very high, (laughs) you know, but then the subsequent ones weren't quite as high. Now, let me ask you this. What about higher than that, low Earth orbit? UAP in near space, does the Galileo project have the ability to detect those? In other words, um, you see a satellite track or something like that, or satellite changes and reverses direction, something weird. Can you see that high up Um, or is it just tailored specifically for atmospheric phenomena. Yeah, so we'll be able to see you know depending on the depending on the size and speed of the object, uh, we'll be able to see things that are very high up, but I think what's better suited to those objects which we are very interested in are uh, satellite images. And so Especially satellites that are that that uh, you know cover the globe at a high frequency, and so we do have a subgroup within the Galileo project that specifically uh, works on uh, acquiring and design satellite imagery and designing algorithms that's able to see if there's anything uh, below those cameras that seem anomalous in nature in terms of their flight paths or their uh, shape or their size. Um, and so, you know, we're sort of tackling it from, from both sides, both from the ground and from space. Unlimited funding, say, were to come along. Could you envision designing a CubeSat that is specifically intended to look for UAP? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Um, essentially shrink the Galileo project set up uh, on the ground and, and, uh, and put it in a cube if you have unlimited funding and then make, uh, hundreds or thousands of copies of it so that, uh, you have, you know, global coverage. Of course, we would not want to you know, harm astronomy from the glints of off of the CubeSats. You know, we've seen that play out with Starlink, and so we'd have to be <laughs> very careful in this hypothetical situation. But, uh, but absolutely, I think that's that that would definitely be um, really, really valuable. Is it harder to do this kind of a search in LEO? than it is from the ground, from the roof of Harvard. I mean, does is it just the further you get out in space, does it get harder and harder to detect small objects? Yeah, it certainly does. So, I mean, the advantage of LEO is that you can look for, you know, if you have a satellite at 500 kilometers, that's going to be really useful if you want to uh, look for objects that are between 100 and 500 kilometers, say, for example. But if you're looking in the atmosphere itself, um, you, you know, you, you are going to be fairly limited in terms of the the resolution you'll get from satellites. Also, there's the issue of um, 
of the third dimension, so altitude. It's, it's really hard to tell from a satellite. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not useful or productive to look for things in the atmosphere from a satellite. It's more, it's more like satellites have the advantage of being able to survey large areas and a particular advantage being able to see things, you know, other things in orbit really clearly. I would say those are the two big advantages while, you know, cameras on the ground, they, you know, smaller, smaller search volume, but you can see things that are within the atmosphere, you know, much more clearly. Even further out. So we have the concept of the von Neumann probe and the idea being that the galaxy is well old enough for civilization to have arisen billions of years before we did and sent out self-replicating probes that could populate every star system in the galaxy with a monitor probe and do it within a frame of a few million years. And if a civilization lasts a billion years, then that's not really that big of a time frame. And let's face it, machines don't care about the passage of time if they can self-repair and self-replicate. Therefore, if something like that, which is really the only realistic way I can think of for an alien presence in a star system, you know, like ours, if such a thing were to have, ha have happened, do we have any hope of being able to detect the needle in the haystack that a von Neumann probe in the solar system must be. Absolutely. So the search for interstellar objects is, is very uh, near and dear to my heart. And indeed, I'm the director of interstellar object studies for the Galileo project. And von Neumann probes would essentially be uh, technological interstellar objects. And you know, it, it's very hard to see small objects in space because if we're talking about reflected light, the amount of light you receive uh, from an object that's that's reflecting light from the sun falls off as distance to the fourth power. But, you know, we are improving that. We are improving our capabilities to detect um, very small amounts of light over large areas of the sky with each generation of telescopes. So the next uh, the next one that's going to be extraordinarily capable in terms of searching for interstellar objects is the Vera Rubin Observatory. And still, we don't see very small objects out to very far, uh, even with the with, uh, you know, modeled performance of the Vera Rubin Observatory. So, you know, there's certainly, we are certainly not picking up, you know, football size, football field size objects in the outer reaches of the solar system. Uh, it's just really, really hard to do so. But all sky surveys, as we build the successors to the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory, should be able to do it at greater resolution. But do you think that we could create, now this is far future stuff, you know, long after we're gone, but do you think that we could create some sort of space-based solar system telescope that could monitor, like the Vera Ribbon will, monitor, in this case, 360 degrees every direction, maybe not exactly towards the sun, but, but you know, look at the solar system to try to determine, you know, th and this is a future study experiment, a big observatory in space, you know, like James Webb or something like that, that's looking in all directions to try to determine if anyone had ever put a von Neumann probe in the solar system. Do you think that is a far future option for humanity? Oh, yeah, I, I really hope that, uh, humanity uh, gets to that point and is able to build something like that because you know if we haven't found uh, a technological civilization by then an instrument like that would would be extraordinarily useful in 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 answering one of the deepest questions we as human beings can ask which is are we alone it's probably the most important question we can ask you know, 
um, other than maybe what is this? <laughs> when we look around at the universe, what exactly is this? Other right. than that, um, we can, we, you know, the question is, are we alone? And it's important to exhaust all options on that before we say we appear to be alone because we're just not that far down that road yet. And the Galileo Project's idea of looking into interstellar objects within the solar system underscores that because we've never looked for them before. You know, we didn't even we hadn't even seen one before Oumuamua, and we only saw it accidentally. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be an interesting field to look at interstellar objects that are passing through. However, there it is potentially possible. I understand that you could have a collection point of interstellar objects in the solar system, Jupiter doing its magic and placing these things in an area where we can go look and have a concentration point for these objects. Right? Tell us about that. Right, yeah. So if interstellar objects are are trapped by the sort of restricted three body, it, you know, if if you think about this as a restricted three body problem, you can end up, um, you know, taking away just enough energy from an interstellar object to put it in a bound orbit. If it if it comes at the solar system at the right angle, at the right time, at the at the right uh, location, and these orbits, you know, this is um, a, a lot of work has been done on this. I think one of the the main papers on this was written by myself and Avi um, a few years ago, and there's been really incredible work done since. But the point is that um, there should be signatures in terms of these trapped orbits. Um, that you know signatures and in inclination and in other orbital elements and so that should help us search for trapped objects if they are there uh the difficulty is you know the same one that i was discussing earlier that it's very hard to see small objects um at really any appreciable distance uh in space and so you know the better telescopes we get the closer we can get to hopefully finding uh, trapped objects within the solar system that originated elsewhere. Now, say we go out there, you know, with, some, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't imagine probes would be able to do it, but say you had a human starship, you know, in 200 years that can go out there and explore these objects. How do you weed out the, um, the natural from the unnatural? In other words, if there is a collection point there that alien technology has shown up in, a techno signature. What are the possible techno signatures? I mean, what would you expect the first thing that you would look at if you saw an artificial object? Well, Avi and I have discussed this a lot, and I th I think it's a reasonable um, expectation for you know the first techno technological um, object that we find. You know, of course, this is all highly speculative, but there you know, you could justify why you might think that it should be space trash. You know, we produce uh, way more waste um, than than we could even fathom. And, and the fact is that, you know, if you have an advanced civilization that is spacefaring, what's the easiest way to dispose of trash? You just eject it from, you know, your your planetary system. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's some, you know, piece of I don't know, steel or something. Uh, and it's not actually an object that was sent to the solar system uh, deliberately. Yeah, I played around with that idea one time. So human starship is moving at a fraction of the speed of light and a guy finds a, a rotten pineapple in, in the uh, refrigerator. So he tosses it out the airlock and all of a sudden you have a relativistic, you know, speed pineapple <laughs> <laughs> flying through the galaxy that could hit someone. <laughs> And that's the interesting thing about interstellar objects is that, I mean, it could be anything, you know, it could be anything. Yep. And if it's simply, you know, a piece of, of, you know, mundane natural rock, you know, of course, it's going to be interesting just simply because of the isotope ratios. But if you find something that's not quite right, you know, a little bit too hard, which I know is getting close to your work there, that, um, 
uh, you might find that alien trash, you know, the alien Pepsi bottle, so to speak, discarded. And that shouldn't be surprising given that the galaxy is 13.8 billion years old. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I'm really excited for, for the surprises and the anomalies that we might find. And, you know, hopefully at the bottom of the ocean, you know, off the coast of uh, Papua New Guinea, we'll begin to find some of these very surprising answers. All right, Amir, thank you for appearing with us yet again. And we'll do it again sometime soon. The next time something weird happens. <laughs> Thanks. Looking forward to it. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. 